Hello everyone and welcome to the end of the week here at the Damage Report. Big day coming up, lots to talk about. Brett Ehrlich, how's it going? Sorry, oh. I called you Brett Ehrlich when I should have called you birthday boy, Brett Ehrlich. How's it going, Thank birthday you. boy? I'm a beautiful birthday boy. I'm a wee beige. Um, I'm all right. I'm using this microphone and it's so loud in my ears and I didn't set it up in a way where I can adjust that. So I, when I talk, just hear the hell out of myself and it's crazy. So there might be a time during the show when I switch to the adjustable headset, but yeah. I'll look like I'm gaming, but that just means I'm really locked in. I haven't That's made the cool. decision yet. Um, I don't but you've done a million shows over the past few months. How is this taking you by surprise right now? Genuinely, I have no clue. I don't know nope. why this is only happening and affecting me now. I think I'm it might just have been, I don't know, it's so stupid. Um, but there's some really great stuff that I will fix this before uh, today. What? Wife is wife is barking orders in the middle of a live show. Put your face on. Sorry, that's a Twitch inside joke. <laughs> Anyhow, so um, something I just want to say is later on today at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern time, you too can watch the common room, and that common room is star studded. It's myself. Uh, that's not the star part. The star part is <laughs> co-creator of The Daily Show, Madeline Smithberg is joining us. Whoa. Uh, Mark Gannick, who wrote most of last season of Archer, will be on the show. And then also Dan Freed, who is a journalist and a news producer. And you might have seen some of his like documentaries that he's done. And he also has a new true crime book out uh, that is about this insane scandal to defraud Navy veterans. And wow. it goes around the world and it's fantastic. So. That, That's like what's happening 20, at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. Yeah. That little bit that you just said about him just feels like it's just so much more than I've achieved or even aimed to achieve. That's the depressing. other thing that he Thanks used that. to do is, so he went bald when he was like 25. And so he was always just old man freed, but he would put on a wig and a bowling shirt. And we lived in San Francisco at the time. And he would stand outside Fisherman's Wharf offering people free tours and calling himself Stan Francisco. <laughs> Hey, do you want to go on to a say tour? To I'm Stan Francisco. I would not. Maybe I would. I would with not. Freed, uh, with Freed, it's so good. So, so hang out with us. We all used to work on a show together called Infomania. Wow, yeah. there's some product placement back in wow. the day. I can match you on that, buddy. Look at this. Mm. Mm. No, not saying anything. Shop TYT. One of anyway, um, he's still on the air. <laughs> anyway, uh, Brett, thank you for being here. Hope that you had a relaxing most of a week off, but not an entire week. What a TYT sort of thing to do. Um, I also will be doing more stuff today. I'm gonna be on the first hour of the Young Turks with Cenk Uger. Um, and it's gonna be really awesome. We're gonna have an awesome guest as well with the power panel. And uh, we got a lot going on here. And I'm gonna say we had a big pre-show and I got really into it and I no longer really remember anything that's on the rundown. So we're gonna go on a voyage of discovery together and both of us are gonna discover what the show is about today. But anyway, we are gonna be talking about the COVID aid bill. We've got a perfect opportunity for Simon Simonson coming up with Ron Johnson's recent activity. We got AOC versus Joe Manchin, which should be a lot of fun. Awesome political ads, and then the garbage people of the week, which I can't wait to see what Brett came up with and what the audience came up with. So anyway, thank you for being here. Please hit the like button, share the stream if you haven't already, and feel free to comment to us, tweet to us, tick and or talk to us, and we will talk back in real time. And with that, Brett, you ready to do this thing? Sir, yes, sir. Okay, let's do it. <clears throat> Bernie Sanders is still pushing for this aid bill to actually pass to be as good as possible. And he is laying out the stakes. One set of stakes isn't talked about quite enough. Here's Bernie Sanders. You got young people who want to go to school, want to socialize, want to date, want to do things that young people do. And they can't do it and have been unable to do that for the last year. And that has resulted in a very sharp increase in mental illness in this country, something by the way, that this legislation also deals with. I wish I was there like, hey, hey, Bernie, love the comment, follow up questions. What are some of the things that the young people want to do? <laughs> you don't want to be specific, but I think we know what you're talking about there. They're Brett ticking, thoughts. they're talking, <laughs> they're texting, they're sexting. They're boofing. <laughs> what if he just There's had all the Eiffel answers? Tower. What if he's like, they're potting the hair down the center? I know that one. 
<laughs> he knows all the trends. He's actually on TikTok like an hour a day. They're doing uh, this yeah. hit dance that's a meme now, and then he just does it. He does like all those <laughs> dances. I just wanted to do something on the Senate floor that ends up making its way into Fortnite. We almost got there. Uh, he's of course right. You know, um, look, there, there's a lot of things that the pandemic has taken away from us, damage that it's done, lives that have been lost. Um, but yeah, no, like I, I, it would be like imagine if it's bad enough, Brett, that this happened during this particular year for us. But imagine if it had been like your first year of college or high school, or if you were in fifth grade, what that would actually be like. Um, and the thing is, there have been a lot of people that have used those sorts of concerns, I would say feigned versions of it, to push for things like reopening prematurely and all of that. And of course, the thing is, there are things we could do to expedite the process of starting back up, of making it safe, of providing schools the funds necessary to make reopening not just preferable, but safe as well. And unfortunately, many of the people making that argument aren't really interested in that. They're interested in some sort of rhetorical flourish that results in everything seemingly going back to normal, even if it results in many, many deaths. Yes, um, it's just everyone is having like memento problems if you take them at their word. Like, why do we have to remind you at this point in the process about COVID relief and the debate over it? We know what happened. Did you forget everything that's happened in previous days? There's a lot going on. This is the thing that the entire election more or less hinged on. And as a result, we need to give people this aid now. Mm -hmm. But yet we need everyone to rehash the same debate. They say that the Senate is the greatest deliberative body in the history of humanity. But I think when they mean deliberate, they just mean slow. And not yeah. deliberation and going over things back and forth to really understand what what's at the heart of it, um, as exactly. evidenced by a bunch of behavior that's happened over the last week. We need to talk about a relatively new show called Un the Republic or UNFTR. As a Young Turks fan, you already know that the government, the media, and corporations are constantly peddling lies that serve the interests of the rich and powerful. But now there's a podcast dedicated to unraveling those lies debunking the conventional wisdom. In each episode of Un the Republic, or UNFTR, the host delves into a different historical episode or topic that's generally misunderstood or purposely obfuscated by the so-called powers that be, featuring in-depth research, razor-sharp commentary, and just the right amount of vulgarity, the UNFTR podcast takes a sledgehammer to what you thought you knew about some of the nation's most sacred historical cows. But don't just take my word for it. The New York Times described UNFTR as consistently compelling and educational, aiming to challenge conventional wisdom and upend the historical narratives that were taught in school. For as the great philosopher Yoda once put it, you must unlearn what you have learned. And that's true whether you're in Jedi training or you're uprooting and exposing all the propaganda and disinformation you've been fed over the course of your lifetime. So search for UNFDR in your podcast app today and get ready to get informed, angered, and entertained all at the same time. Bernie Sanders has been pushing for a $15 an hour minimum wage for a very long time. We're now at like the hot point of that conversation. Unfortunately, probably it's gonna go away soon, but at least right now while he can, he is trying with a vote earlier today, this was just before we went live, to get it added to the bill over the recommendation of the parliamentarian. And let's take a look at some of the actual vote on that procedural motion. Mr. Cornyn, Mr. Cornyn, no. Mr. Manchin, Mr. Manchin, no. Mr. Langford, Mr. Langford, no. Ms. Hirono, Ms. Hirono, on. Hey, we got an eye. There was actually one person who supported it. So most of those were Republicans. But you did see that Joe Manchin voted against it. He did not want the raise to the minimum wage being added. Shocking stuff. The issue was that it wasn't just him. Um, basically, all of the Republicans voted against it. You can see an actual graphic of the final vote. It was 38 to 58. And why not for something that is overwhelmingly supported amongst voters? Couldn't even get to the 40 point. Uh, Lindsey Graham tried to stop it from actually happening. He tried to stop the vote from actually happening. But once it started, we got to see not just Joe Manchin vote against it on the Democratic side, 
But Tester and Shaheen voted no, King voted no, Cinema voted no, Chris Coons voted no, Carper voted no, Maggie Hassan voted no. So many Democrats voted no because screw those people on minimum wage during the worst economic depression combined with the worst public health issues that we've had in recent memory. I just don't. I don't buy that those two things need to go together. I don't think they need to go. I don't think logically it follows that raising the minimum wage should be linked to the COVID-19 relief package. I don't, don't think I don't think there's an there's a I don't think it it is very obvious and easy to message on that these things need to go together. What? Um, but no, I don't. I I think it's like why are you putting the minimum wage in the COVID-19? I think there's an answer to that question. That is, mm-hmm. how else am I going to do it? It's okay. so late, guys. It is so late to have this not quite adjusted for inflation minimum wage level. And it has got to have everyone ripping their hair out that the only way to accomplish this is to put it in the COVID 19 aid package. What is your argument for those things needing to go together, John? I mean, I think that's a pretty strong one. I would say that it is a form of economic aid and future aid for people who have been and will continue to be economically set back from the experience of the last year. But I would say that even beyond that, if it is literally the only way to do it, I think that that's a pretty strong position with which to mention or with which to message about it. Especially when, as we've said, it is incredibly popular and when it is exactly what has been promised in the last few months, both in the run up to the general election and the special election. Right, those things, I mean, it's one of, I would raise raise it as, listen, Democrats need to be better at politics to get this through. And that's it. And they're all, and there's two reasons. One is the benefit of the doubt reason is that they're scared that they'll do something to the economy they can't go back from. Um, it still doesn't make any sense that the minimum wage is seven dollars and twenty five cents when even in Joe Manchin's uh, state it's higher than that in mm-hmm. West Virginia. I totally, as I said on the show like last week, things get so far behind that when you try to do a half measure, you're still doubling what it is right now. So yeah. the minimum wage should be way higher than fifteen dollars. $15 is like a, well, we're not gonna fully adjust it for inflation based on what it was when we changed it last. We're gonna go halfway. And then you have all these people like Joe Manchin, who TYT investigates reported, has a monetary interest in keeping in multiple, definitely one, but maybe more than that, in maybe two or three businesses, a monetary interest in not changing the minimum wage as an investor in businesses. The hotel, the hotel that he owns, the hotel that he owns, he owns a hotel, has a, a, a large monetary interest in a hotel, mm-hmm. pays people just barely over minimum wage by like 20 cents an hour. And the other yeah. thing, the re, the one that he wants to move it to $11, he pays like $11 and eight cents. So that's what he wants to do. He doesn't want to, he doesn't want change for for people, for the good of his state or the country. He wants the kind of change that literally won't affect them. And that's what's so frustrating about it. They get to live these lives where not changing things, it benefits them. And even the proposed change, they don't wanna make themselves the least bit uncomfortable. And in doing so, they're ignoring how wildly more than uncomfortable people are living in the status quo. Yeah, well, in any event, yeah. It's a totally good point that we get so far behind, so radically behind that even sort of trying to bring it up close to what it should be is able to be presented as a radical motion. Yeah, they put us in a terrible position and Bernie Sanders, um, he tried to do not necessarily the best way that he could have done this, but he did try to get it put in. And uh, although this wasn't an actual vote on the minimum wage increase, it was a vote on the effort to tie it to, which provides at least a little bit of cover for those who voted no to say, no, no, I totally still support it, just not in this way. Um, as you know, even Brett pointed out, even Brett, can't, even you can't more on Brett. <laughs> I don't know why I said that. As Brett pointed out, as Brett so rightly pointed out, and let it be noted that Brett did. Um, if you can't pass it now under reconciliation, how the hell do you think you're gonna pass it outside of it when Joe Manchin neither supports the raise nor supports the means necessary to get it passed? 
and not just him, as we've been reminded from this segment. Senator Ron Johnson has tried everything he can think of to stop the COVID aid bill from being passed. And we've got two examples of that. We're gonna start off with the slightly more laughable of the two. So he tried to argue that you should be against the aid bill because of how thick it would be if you were to stack up all the dollars in it. And he literally, like, Take a look at this picture. This is what he was doing, a stack of $1 trillion. He put the thickness of a bill, the thickness of a trillion bills, how long a mile is. He did the math for once. And Brett, as soon as I saw this, it made me think of you and your Simon Simonsons. Hi, I'm <laughs> Simon Simonson. It's not great. I'm Simon Simonson from Simonson Signs. I sold some signs to Ron Johnson because he had some to signs on giving a sign about how many times you could you could go to the moon with the trillion dollars. And I just charged him essentially <laughs> one mile worth of dollars for it. <laughs> that would be a ton. But um, I, I so. love it. I love having to put your like that is not the unit we use. We do not use thickness. As a monetary unit, we don't do that, mm-hmm. and and it's like not really understanding, like what that would communicate. Like people do that all the time. They're like, "This, look at the bill," and they stack up the budget. This is the budget, and no one has read it. That mm-hmm. is what people do. This is the budget. None of you have read it. But he couldn't do that with this because it's only six hundred pages, so it's only like that thick, mm-hmm. and it's covering millions and millions of Americans. And a lot of it has already passed in previous COVID packages. So we couldn't yeah. do that. He's like, what else could I use the thickness thing for? The same way he's always like, all right, what are we gonna use a sign for? What stupid sign can we make? Because we yeah. think the American people are so stupid that if we just show them big numbers, they'll say, well, I definitely don't need to buy food. Look at that number. Exactly. I should go hungry. I should not have a job. That I lost my job, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to make a stack that goes to the moon and back. Um, I love yeah, that I he only know. thinks there's one dollar bills. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Just, you know, there's twenties. Yeah, yeah, it would be less. I could do the math on it. Um, yeah, I don't know, Ron Johnson. If if you're worried about the thickness of things, uh, if we were to print out all of the obituaries for people who died to COVID that didn't need to, how high would that stack be? What if we were to print out all of the applications for unemployment that people had to fill out um, because the pandemic was much worse and lasted much longer than it should? What if we were to stack that up? How how many times to the moon would that go, Ron Johnson? Since we're talking about the thickness of paper, that's what the government should be concerned with. But anyway, we're we're like engaging seriously with this. Why are we doing that? Because we can also do this. When you stand next to a white sheet of paper, it's not difficult to strip it of context, which Full Frontal with Sam B did, saying have at it, and they put up the blank version. Normally, you have to wait for Parker Malloy to, to make this available, but Sam B got out in front. And so uh, I like to think that this is this is probably one of Brett's favorites. They just put him next to a dog providing yeah. something. How many times would you have to take what the dog is making to get to the moon and back? Stay tuned to find out. I like this one with Ron Johnson's net worth. Hey, what do you know? He's not suffering during the pandemic. He's gonna be just fine. You've got this one. I don't know why, but I love it. <laughs> there was a great one of Trump that we decided not to put because I don't know if anyone. But um, we also have this. He decided to calm people during this contentious time. And uh, I guess you know, pop culture wise, he's interested in the same shows that we are, as you can see in this last one. And I swear to God, if anyone spoils it. But anyway, John, uh, Brett, the, the statute of limitations on spoiling an episode of WandaVision is twelve thirty three. A.M. on Friday morning. No, it's no. nuts, dude. I mean, it's not it, acceptable. It's so difficult not to have that spoiler. I think a lot there isn't a lot of Photoshop that I would do to the original, where it just says thickness of a one mm-hmm. trillion of a one dollar bill. I would say you just take out one dollar bill and you put Ron Johnson's penis. <laughs> Thickness of Ron Johnson's of Ron's Johnson. Thickness of Ron's Johnson. 0.0043 inch. John's not having a good time. Thickness of a trillion Ron Johnsons. 
four point yeah. three billion. And people, oh God, and people are pointing out that even if you're going to be committed to the money thing, why go with the dollar bills? If you can choose arbitrary units of currency, why not go with quarters? Or uh, Barkley says Stanley nickels, for instance. How, how we could go to Uranus and back with Stanley nickels, I guess. Um, yeah, uh, look, it's obviously it's a big waste of time. It's everybody's dumber for having exposed themselves to what this US Senator did with his time. And yet good, because that, that summarizes how the Republicans have viewed not only what they did and didn't do during the pandemic, but their continued presence as people who are just supposed to be standing between the American people and aid. And I only hope that going forward, people never forget that this is what the Republicans did during this time. Yeah. In addition to talking about the thickness of a dollar bill, Ron Johnson also decided that although he can't stop the coronavirus aid bill from being passed, he can at least delay it so that people who are desperate for help have to wait an extra day or two. He forced the Senate floor staff to read the entire bill, a maneuver that could take up to 10 hours and will delay a final vote on the legislation. Typically, the Senate waives the full reading of bills or amendments, but Johnson had vowed to force Senate floor staff to read the bill, arguing it would give senators time to craft amendments and for Americans to learn the details of the legislation. That's what's going to happen with that. And so it was set up for hours and hours of reading, which I believe he didn't actually even go to. And the evidence for that is that there's this tweet from Paul Kane who says, still struggling to understand the Ron Johnson last night. He forced nonpartisan Senate staff to read the entire COVID bill for 10 hours. Yet he wasn't there to object when Dems reduced debate to three hours instead of 20. So now the bill is moving faster to passage, not slower, even considering his reading. So did you want to slow it down or did you not want to slow it down? If we were going to learn so much from this, why weren't you there to actually learn anything from it? And yet we know the answers to all of these questions. Right, yes. To answer your rhetorical question, it is 100% political theater. Mm-hmm. Um, it is the world's worst audiobook. <laughs> and there was a moment at the very end when the uh, whoever was tasked with the thankless job of reading it aloud realized that he was really close to it. So he was like, had been re- reading very Ben Stein slowly. And then realized he was close. Someone came in to like do a motion to adjourn. And he just was like, and 7.8 point B, there's six, three dollars micro machines done. And then he just totally slapped it down. But the idea, and, and I saw it reported elsewhere that Ron Johnson just got up and left because he wasn't there for it. He wanted people he to read care. it out. And, and, P, and wisely, a handful of senators said, good, good. Mm-hmm. We can read it out. We're going to delay this longer, but we are going to give an, an opportunity for people to hear just to what extent we're helping them. Now, I am certain that there is a ton of pork. Some of it got pulled out of the, um, they pulled out some of the pork from this original bill, but um, some of it was really, really stupid and they didn't need to be in there. And it was handing out things to specific constituencies that didn't really, wasn't really related to it. And that's, it's fine to point that out and remove it, but that is not the intention of any of these Republicans. They are trying yeah. to do two things. They're trying to stop helping people. And the idea that the Democrats are not just waltzing over the goal line with this very obvious win is insane. It is yeah. insane. That shows you how warped the system is, how corrupt the people inside it are, that they think that they have somehow achieved the win by blocking help to people in the middle of a huge crisis. Yep. The entire thing was so bungled. Anyway, um, okay, let's move on to- I don't think it will end up having been bungled. I think people will look back at it and say, yes, they did pass these things. And yes, the Republicans stopped them every step of the way. It's just so frustrating because we're in the thick of it right now. But I don't think it's 100% wildly bungled. I don't. Well, yeah, I don't think it's 100%. But I think you know from the beginning with the what the check is actually going to be, saying that you're going to do the targeting and then backing off when the response is really bad, and then a couple weeks later you put the targeting back in with lower thresholds. And now they're doing the thing with unemployment where in theory it's being extended longer than the house was gonna do. But they're also making the actual dollar amount lower 
for for each month, which is going to look really bad. It's just a lot of this is just it's needless when you aren't actually negotiating with the Republicans since there's nothing that you could put in there that would result in a single one voting for it. Um, and also you're just producing potentially, whether in reality, at least potentially weeks of uh, reporting and headlines that are gonna look bad to the people who are out there desperately waiting for help. Yeah. Two ends of the Democratic Party, at least in some ways, are Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Senator Joe Manchin. And they have been feuding for several months now. It sort of picked up in December of last year with Manchin saying of her in an incredibly condescending way. I guess she put the dagger stare on me. I don't know the young lady, I really don't, the young lady. I never met her. I'm understanding she's not that active with her bills or in committee. She's more active on Twitter than anything else. And that is such an insane way to characterize of all people in Congress, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, that she's not busy in either legislation or committees. But he goes on to say to differentiate himself from her since they come from very different parts of the party. We're not gonna defund the police, we're not for the new Green Deal. Because why would a US Senator know the name of something that we've been talking about nationally for a couple of years now? That's not going to happen, we're not for Medicare for all. We can't even pay for Medicare for some. Here by the way is the picture that he'd been referring to with the daggers, which I just love. It reminds me of Greta Thunberg with Trump at that international (laughs) summit. But anyway, she responded by saying, I find it amusing when politicians try to diminish the seriousness of our policy work, movement organizing and grassroots fundraising to she just tweets as though serious politics is only done by begging corporate CEOs for money through wax sealed envelopes delivered by Raven, which I think is a tweet that was personally crafted specifically for me, or at least that's how I received it. But anyway, um, so they've been disagreeing. And there are arguments made in defense of Joe Manchin that this is what he has to do, or that AOC you know, they may not be as explicit in saying she's just a big tweeter and that's it. She's not actually popular. People aren't into her. It's just a social media thing. So we're gonna have some polling data on that, Brett, but I want to get your thoughts first. It's just so strange to me that he he doesn't understand what politics is. And and he's and he's got such weird politics right now. That's what's very frustrating. I know these are old tweets, but like the politics he is waging right now is insane. He's getting outflanked by the former governor or the current governor of of uh, Wisconsin because he won't advocate for a $15 an hour minimum wage. And he doesn't, he, he is just blocking the things that will help people. Mm-hmm. And there's no real good argument for it just from a political standpoint. It doesn't make sense. Whereas her politics that she is uh, offering as a counterpoint to these, Things that are coming from a place of someone who hasn't been in the Senate insulated this from from reality for this long. Someone who came from as a, as the next generation of politician who looks at this generation and doesn't have that same oh well they know better approach to things mm-hmm. is pointing out and saying actually you guys don't know better. We know better because we're living in it every single day. We see the consequences of. The failures of our government, and now it's really exposed. This is the part of the experiment where we get to see what if the Democrats do have power and aren't and have no excuse like they did during the Obama era, where there's a recount and they're they only and Ted Kennedy dies and all that stuff, where mm-hmm. they can and and they have the they might hide behind not knowing that the Republicans were that devoid of integrity and honesty. Now you have everything set down so we can look at it and say, no, it's just, it isn't a mistake. They're just shooting themselves in the foot or or pretending do or flopping and saying, oh, mm-hmm. I was fouled. I tripped over a, the, the three yard line. It's like, no, that's just, that's just paint, man. You, yeah. you have no <laughs> excuse not to do this. Yet you're saying, oh my well, God, I, there's other things out there we don't want. But no, even the people in your state, guaranteed, if they were given the option of voting on a $15 an hour minimum wage, they would vote for it. How do I know? Totally. You ask them. There's so many things that so many Americans agree with that the Senate and the House refuses to do for no good reason. I think. I, look, I agree, largely they don't have those excuses, except that he is sort of providing it. Like if they're shooting themselves in the foot, then plausibly mansions the gun, 
The parliamentarian is the bullet. I guess the foot is all of Biden's very clear promises. Um, they shouldn't have any of these excuses, particularly in this bill where they don't need any of the Republicans to sign on. And yet, what do you know? They still are not going to accomplish much. Um, and so that they is incredibly gonna frustrating. Accomplish, but they're going to accomplish a lot. They're going to pass a COVID aid bill that we've been waiting for for months and months and months and months and months that should have been passed long before the Democrats actually took over. And that should be the easiest thing imaginable to actually do. And things that are totally unilaterally under Biden's control, he's not doing. what. Even if objectively he should do it because he says he supports these things. For instance, an executive order to cancel student loan debt. He's promised he'll do it. He says he supports it. He could do it, but he's not doing it. Both because of the promises or even to offset some of the other things you're not able to deliver right now, like raising the minimum wage. You could at least do this to send a signal to those who voted for you that, sure, we're running into some roadblocks, but I'm gonna have your back. He's not doing things that Manchin can't stop, that the parliamentarian hasn't even advised against. And that's part of the frustration. Well, they're gonna accomplish so much compared to what they normally accomplish. That's sure that's the point. they didn't have it's like, yes, they will. But that's that's my point is like they're going to accomplish so much and it's probably going to be one or two things. And the only reason it's going to feel like a lot in retrospect is because they usually accomplish zero or negative things. That's mm-hmm. it. No, I get it. And I get it. But like there's a comment on Twitch right now that's like it's been two months. He has four years. Yeah. And, and generally, when do presidents generally get the most done? In, in the, the latter year or two? Yeah, no, so that's this is when we need to do it. Um, the midterms are going to be devastating. There's gonna be even less possibility of getting anything done. And by the way, that's once we've hit the midterms and we're past it and they have probably lost control of literally everything. In the run up to it, they will use the midterms as an excuse to not do anything. I don't think most people, I, you know, I, I can't speak for any individual, maybe haven't super closely followed American politics. There is like 10 minutes where there's not some massive excuse to not do anything, and we cannot afford to lose that. When you ask the voters about the different ends of the Democratic Party, at least in terms of elected officials, what do they actually prefer? Well, it is pretty clear. We're going to compare approval ratings for Alexandria Ocasio Cortez and Joe Manchin. Among Democrats, for Ocasio Cortez, 47% say they view her very favorably and 28% somewhat favorably. So that is overwhelming, very or somewhat favorable, and a lot of very. Like half of Democrats like her as much as they are able to communicate in a poll. For Manchin among Democrats, it's 4% very favorably and 18% somewhat favorable. So that's 22 versus her 75. So it ain't close. There's almost no one that's like, Joe Manchin is totally my guy, two thumbs up. And yet I feel like the conversation nationally is AOC is kind of a divisive figure. Don't really know about her. We need, you know, bipartisanship and, you know, Democrats that can like, they're a little bit more moderate. They represent more of the, but do they represent more of the country when so few Democrats seem at all interested in Joe Manchin? But this is what doesn't make sense. So the 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 top level, or I don't know, top level, but like the very basic answer to that poll data in Manchin's favor is that a Democrat in West Virginia is not the equivalent of a Democrat literally anywhere else. It's not. But what? But the the truth when you start analyzing that is actually more devastating and more puzzling that Manchin would be behaving the way he is. Because mm-hmm. the Democrats in West Virginia are, you know, half of the people that we know as Republicans from West Virginia switched parties after the realignment solidified exactly who that yeah. was. So they used to be Democrats anyway, like the same way that Andy, that a Bashir keeps getting elected as a Democrat in Kentucky is because of the personal vote. So really, it's up in the air in terms of who you want to vote for based on what they're advocating for, and. The kind of moderate Democrat that Manchin is becoming is not the kind of moderate Democrat you would expect out of West Virginia. It's a poor state. Yeah. I get his opposition to the Green New Deal because there's a lot of coal getting pulled out of the ground in West Virginia. But a lot of the populism, that $15 an hour minimum wage, that economic populism should resonate. In West Virginia, so he should be taking this opportunity 
to get that $15 an hour minimum wage in his in, in the bill now when it's not kind of pegged to some other initiative like the Green New Deal where you could understand West Virginians being opposed to it. It just doesn't make sense to me. Instead, One he wants to be the bell at the ball and he knows he has the power and he wants to use it. It's so puzzling. Like Arizona is a completely different thing and you could see cinema reading different tea leaves, but but mansion $15 an hour. When yeah. the Republican, you know, one of the turncoat former Democrat, now Republican governor, governor, is is advocating for fifteen dollar an hour minimum wage. It just doesn't make sense. That's why people hate yeah, him. And, and and look, if he if he is a different sort of Democrat, I think the idea is that he is supposed to be because Democrats broadly in West Virginia will be different. Even though I think I think that gets exaggerated. Um, but sure, there's some difference. And also that That's wrong. he like in what that that there are a hundred like I don't I think that some of the same fundamental economic concerns having to do with things like wages, health insurance and things like that, I don't think are that dissimilar from West Virginia and other states. I just in mean theory, he, I, I mean this guy he might this guy even more let me characterize Joe Manchin for you in Joe Manchin's political affiliations with you. He used a rifle to shoot um and I think I might be mixing a couple commercials. He uses a rifle to shoot a, legis- a bit of legislation that would take away coverage for people's pre existing conditions. Uh, right? He shot the cap and trade bill. He shot the cap. He shoots Wait, every. He has so many he ads with guns. also shot with a shotgun an anti Obamacare lawsuit. I can't yeah. tell if that was positive towards. No, he said you're going to come down. You know, he's basically said you're going to take away coverage from pre-existing conditions. You're going to do it from my cold, dead hands. So he needs to say shooting legislation. I'm no, no. He can't keep. He's like I. The NRA loves me, and I want to give you health care, and I want to give you fifteen dollars an hour minimum wage. That's that's where it breaks down for me. I don't fully understand. I love someone to explain it to me. But when I'm talking about the difference, that's what I'm talking about. There's a lot of people who like I don't like I don't trust the government. I don't like it, but I love Medicare and Social Security, and I love coverage for my pre-existing conditions because I can't get health care because the coal companies come in and and they pay me they they treat me like hell. They pollute the hell out of my family. We all have cancer, but it's the only game in town. And I'm not gonna let I'm not gonna listen to people who say we're gonna give you a solar power job because we're coal miners. And and it doesn't all hold together, but not, I totally understand the argument to say like, are. don't transfer what? It's not that many people. It, again, it gets exaggerated how many people actually work in that. I mean, I'm and, not, and, like, and it's never going like to be an example of of whatever industry they have of the few that can exist in West Virginia. Yeah, all the more reason to start up new industries that at least in theory could grow in a way that the coal industry is never going to be able to. It's not that big now, it's only inevitably gonna be smaller. All the more reason to, I don't know, take some of those mountains you blasted the top off of and put some solar panels on it, I don't know. But that's, just saying that's it, what I'm, t- and, and John, I agree with you in terms of like the logic of your argument. But in terms of dealing with people and convincing them that they should accept a huge change in their life and trust the government about it. I'm just talking about the messaging challenge. Sure, okay. I had more I want to say, but we have a lot that we have, else we have to get to. I will say that the polling also shows that the, the numbers that I showed were amongst Democrats. When you ask voters more broadly, which in theory, I would argue if Manchin is supposed to be more appealing to Republicans or conservatives, he should have a competitive advantage in. No, she's still twice as popular with voters broadly than with just Democrats. We've got something awesome for you, a collaboration between Move On and Twitch, where you all in Twitch, including many of the people who are watching this right now on Twitch, with Jordan Yule of Deep Dive, the deep diver himself, put together collaboratively an ad for Dina Turner, who's running in Ohio's 11th district right now. Let's take a look at this. Ain't this something? You know, we got people talking about practicality. What's practical? Well, if you're wealthy enough, you can sit back and wax poetic about practical. But if you are poor, baby, practical ain't working for you. It ain't working. Let me tell you something. The division has already been set. And it is a corrupt system in this country that hurts the working people. Are you on the side of the working day people of this nation? Either you are on their side or you are not. Either you're gonna take a position. 
position and know that Medicare for all is a human right in this country or you do not. Either you believe that women deserve their whole damn dollar or you do not. Either you are willing to stare down a legal system that sees black men and black women as somehow more criminal than anybody else is a multi-generational, multi-gendered, multi-ethnic, multi-racial movement of conscious-minded people. That's who we are. That's what we are. And we are not gonna let anybody divide us. We coming together to transform this nation. Hello, somebody. Oh, we cut off the hello, somebody. Come on, what are you doing? But anyway, uh, okay, great work putting that together. And that's not the whole ad, by the way. There is a little bit more. It's available. You can go to Move On's uh, Twitter account. But uh, Brett, like, I don't, I don't know that I've ever seen an ad put together over the course of a couple of streams collaboratively with the Twitch audience in Jordan, selecting B-roll, figuring out timing of things, choosing music. I feel like this is actually a first, and they started off on an awesome foot. Yes, it is a first as far as I am concerned as well because uh, it seemed like I, I don't remember it and I know everything about everything. But uh, even if it's not the first, I'm pretty sure it is the first time that this has happened. What an amazing thing. I mean, yeah. it is a community coming together when they talk about grassroots and, and move on being essentially like the biggest grassroots progressive organization out there. Um, and Jordan Ewell kind of being the, the, the person who is able to coordinate between our audience and getting it pushed out there within minutes. Nina had seen it, retweeted it, tweeted it again, just like by herself. Mm -hmm. And it had tens of thousands of views pretty instantly. Who knows how many it has right now? Um, it's awesome. And this is yeah. really, you know, it, with Nina Turner, also you have so much to choose from. Yeah, because as someone said, like every clause slaps you in the face. Someone said that in Twitch, and it's <laughs> true. It's just, and I saw someone else say, like, you can watch this and get chills for free. And every time she talks, I get chills. <laughs> when I Fantastic. interview her, yeah, I, that's one of the main reasons I interview her is to get that, to get fired up to do this some more. Um, I think it's 112,000 views I'm reading on Twitch now. Just, just amazing, great work. Oh gosh, she's like her speeches just fire you up. I really hope that she wins. It would be awesome to have her in Congress and and eventually even more like her. And God only knows where she's gonna end up because she's just, she's really something. And uh, great work by Jordan, by the way. 100%, uh, awesome. so good. As always, makes me a little bit ashamed. So he used the collaborative process on Twitch to produce this awesome ad. And God only knows what he's gonna produce in the future. I once thought, about using my Twitch channel to collaboratively create the world for the animal focused fantasy novels that I wanna write. <laughs> Doesn't seem like it produces as much social good as what Jordan is doing. And I think that anyway. violates terms of service as well. So I think the Jordan's approach, definitely <laughs> uh, better for <laughs> people and legally it fits a lot better. So. Uh, yeah. Just really awesome. And it was awesome because I was watching it happen at the time. I was like, oh my God, he has the whole editing process open. And just to tell yeah. you something on my Twitch channel that I've done in the past, I do a segment called Photoshopping Butts on Your Instagram. So these things, <laughs> wait, what? what is that like? I can't tell. So basically I take, I'm glad you asked. You take people's <laughs> Instagrams and you go there and then you, I have a whole trove wow. of butts with the Jennies covered. And then I put the butt, so like, let's say that there's a hill. In the background, I'll turn into a butt. Hey, bro. We should cut oh, the video yeah. if we're going to share it with anyone. We should cut it before the butt Instagram. Yeah, thing. let's not talk Here's about the editor note. But anyway, um, yes. Anyway, the, the point of this is Jordan's better than us. Everyone needs yeah. to understand this. And I can't yeah. wait. Some people are saying he should make one for Gary Chambers, which he totally should. It's the end of the week, and so it's time to take out the trash. Okay, this is the garbage people of the week and I've got one. This is a current story, but it feels like a bit of a throwback. We had a lot of garbage people of this sort last year. It's possible, I didn't check, but it's possible this person might have been one last year. We think Marissa, 
They were? Okay, well, they're coming back. So mine is Amberlynn Gills. Amberlynn Gills, you can probably tell from the photo, has an issue with masks. But that's not the issue. At this point in America, just being an anti-masker by itself isn't enough to get you put in the garbage can. You need to go above and beyond, and she in fact did. But before we get to the new part of this, we wanna catch you up. She had gone into a Starbucks and didn't wanna wear a mask, even though she knew going in that she would have to. She wanted to create a public spectacle of herself, and so she did. Now, when this individual Lennon asked her to, she decided to post on Facebook a photo of him with meet Lennon misspelled from Starbucks who refused to serve me because I'm not wearing a mask. Next time I will wait for cops and bring a medical exemption, which is definitely more convenient than or just going in with a mask on or getting it delivered or something like that. But anyway, as a result of her making this big viral Facebook thing attacking Lennon, people rallied to the breeze to support. An individual named Matt Cohen started a GoFundMe to tip him. Originally, they wanted to raise $1,000, they raised $150. $5,000 for that barista, which is crazy, but not as crazy as what happened next, which is that that individual, the woman who didn't want to wear a mask and put his picture online said that she wanted half of the GoFundMe money. She asserted that there had been discrimination, claiming she did not have to wear masks because she received a medical exemption from a chiropractor. I don't know what that has to do with getting half of money that was raised for a person. But you should understand that in the meantime, because that happened last year, the Starbucks thing. In the meantime, her Facebook account indicates she remains a staunch opponent of mask wearing. A video from August showed her getting into a separate spat with employees at Sprouts Farmers Market because she refused to wear one. And bear in mind, She's still making videos of her going and not wearing a mask so she can argue with working class Americans, which is awesome. Now, the individual who is being sued is the one who raised the money, Matt Cohen. He said that she made a public Facebook post that went viral, and I'm not responsible for whatever anybody else sends to her. Everything was done in a philanthropic sense, and I used publicly available information to populate my GoFundMe. Because in her lawsuit, and she is suing for half of that money, she says that she received death threats, which is obviously awful, but I don't see how Matt Cohen produced that. And he says that she um, she is saying that he targeted her by having a photo of her on the GoFundMe. But just bear in mind, she posted on social media about this first. She made it a big public thing before he made it a public thing. And again, I don't have any idea what any of this has to do with her being entitled to half of the money that was raised. So you could have avoided all of this by just wearing a mask. But if you're not gonna do that, you don't get 50 grand and thus garbage can. Right, what the best, think? what's the best, what do you think is the best part of that story? Cuz there is an answer. Oh, I don't know, it's all pretty similar. What do you think is the standout? The best part of that story is that she got a respiratory disease medical exemption from her chiropractor. <laughs> That's a great, I completely skipped over that. <laughs> I'm gonna crack your bones. The, the, it's like, oh, I got my military exemption from a GI Joe doll. Like what? That doesn't make any sense. Like my leg hurts and I totally got that information from a neurosurgeon. Like, no, that's not the person in charge of that. <laughs> I don't think you went to your chiropractor because your chiropractor is exactly the kind of medical professional. Not not in general chiropractors do that, but you probably knew your chiropractor and were like, can you please write me an exemption? Mm -hmm. It's like the equivalent of weed doctors in 2004, where you'd be <laughs> like, hey, can you just tell people I'm stressed so I can get a freaking weed card and buy this <laughs> by this eighth. Like that's what it is. You do not have a real medical exemption. That type of medical exemption does not exist and definitely does not mandate that that location and everyone's still doing this because they're so insulated on their social media feeds. It does not mandate that that establishment has to give you service. Yeah, they don't. This is not an this is not what they meant when they said ADA compliant. Just terrible. Just <sighs> so good. Like it's a crazy amount of money in any event, but it was produced. People gave it. It's not yours. Um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe she needs the money because of her chiropractor bills. I don't know. Like, I don't know. Are they expensive? Do you ever you ever get your your lung cracked? They like put the elbow in and then they crack the lung. It really helps. Helps me breathe freely.
my garbage person is Candace Owens. What? Candace Owens, who won't let any kind of conspiracy theory or opportunity to put her face on camera go to waste. She has very obviously, the same way she came up with Blexit as a cool new slogan, she <laughs> has a new adaptation of QAnon that she really, really wants Laura Ingram to come around on. Here's how that went down. You are absolutely right. And let me also say, and, and conservatives need to start saying this more, QAnon has now transformed into Blue Anon, right? This is a Democrat run. They are coming up with conspiracy theories and saying that all of these things are going on so that they can rush through policies and push through policies and say, because there's some obscure threat. They're not providing any details regarding this threat. And let me tell you, as a DC resident, it looks like we are under a military occupation. We have, this is the most popular president in American history. Why does he need to erect all of these walls around the White House? Shouldn't he be able to just simply walk down the street and shake hands because he's the most loved and popular and most voted for president, more popular than Barack Obama in 2008, and you and yet you have the Capitol under lockdown and under a military occupation? My brain is bleeding from that last point. I know that that's not the point that you want to focus on, but the idea that because he's popular, right wingers don't want to assassinate him is madness. Just insane. Madness, but, but go on. So all of this, the point that she was making was essentially she 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 wants to make a point about why the Capitol was locked down and why there was essentially has essentially been locked down and why there was no you know legislative session due to the threat of some kind of uh, attack on the Capitol on March 4th, right? Mm -hmm. So that was what she's pointing out. And she says, no, uh, the, it's, it's the equivalent of QAnon. It's not QAnon, it's become Blue Anon because it's the Democrats and the president who are coming up with these fake conspiracy theories that they're using to shut everything down. And the response to that is, well, I think you just alienated most of your audience because you're calling them insane. So I think it's just a bad rhetorical move on their part. And then mm -hmm. do I need to remind you why they are locking these things down? Now, I'm fine. I totally will have a conversation about like unnecessary reactions to attacks. But like, I do I have to remind you why they have locked down the Capitol? And how it's not just some ethereal potential threat of violence. Do you remember this? <laughs> like it isn't an ethereal threat of attack. This is like those same crazies. Pointed to the fourth as a time to attack. So yep. it's locked down. And again, the point that you made, which is just because of more people like him than liked other presidents, doesn't mean that no one hates him. In fact, in the tribal environment that you and the host of the show you're on helped to create, it means that anyone who's not for that president is more likely to be avidly, unhingedly against mm -hmm. that president in a way that could lead to violence. But the truth yeah. is, like, I will have that open conversation, that conversation about what is too much of a reaction in terms of taking away people's civil liberties. But well, I agree. No, but we're, she doesn't we doesn't want to have that. Earnest clear on that. Like, yeah, is everything that that is it's already legal. You don't need any new laws. We totally agree on that. That that's not, I don't think, at question. The idea, though, that. Like if Biden, if Biden is popular mostly, it doesn't mean that there aren't still threats against him. Particularly when, like that's even when you ignore the fact that a predisposition to political violence is not evenly distributed across the population. It is 100% clustered in the group that I would say 100% does not like Joe Biden. But even if it did, like the it's the idea of trying to say, well, QAnon is getting kind of embarrassing. It's it's. Like so many of our people believe it, and it makes us look like kooks. And now we're going to say it's blue and on. It's the Democrats that are behind it, but not being said in a way that, like she and I mentioned this in the pre-show. She's not saying, "Hey, people watching Laura Ingram who believe in QAnon," because definitely there's a bunch that do. She's not saying you guys need to wake up because the Democrats are manipulating you. 
She doesn't want them to stop believing these things. Um, she just wants to somehow imply that QAnon is a Democrat thing, that it's not the right that's crazy, it's the Dems that are crazy. In the same way that Tucker Carlson, every night in his show, he's saying he's trying to come up with some sort of conspiracy theory that Democrats believe that's equivalent to literally millions of Americans thinking that Chrissy Teigen eats babies to get their hormones. Like they're all desperate to apologize for how big QAnon has gotten. They just haven't come up with a really good way to do that. That's the best that she can come up with, and it's just not very good. And the worst part is they're just gonna repeat it over and over again. Oh, yeah, she's gonna and try to get it. it trending. Yeah. Over blue and on. But it's like that's Clever. it's it's like gate to everything. You're adding gate, but Watergate was the name of a hotel. You're gonna yeah. say deflate gate. Like, no, gate is not a suffix <laughs> that means scandal. Scandal. The same yeah. way that a thon is not a suffix that means a lot of something. I actually thought that one. I did think that one. <laughs> anyway, uh, good garbage person though. Uh, we don't often bring her up, but when we do, probably gonna be in this context. Anyway, Brett, happy birthday week to you. I know a lot of people are really excited for Common Room this week. Uh, what can people, if people are tuning in now and don't know, who can they expect to see? Co creator of The Daily Show, Madeline Smithberg, writer of uh, about half of this last season of Archer Mark Gannick, and journalist mm -hmm. and true crime writer Dan Freed. We all used to work on a show back in the day. We're going to talk about what that was like and what it's like now to work in our various industries. Don't miss it, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tyt. Very cool. And uh, everyone, thank you for watching not only today, but throughout the week. Really do appreciate it. We've got a lot planned for following weeks. Uh, we're having, I don't know, I talked about this a little bit on the pre show. We're having a weird time algorithm wise. YouTube is having some issues. So we very much appreciate everyone who's sticking with us and watching the show, liking, sending super chats, all that. I very much uh, appreciate that. Hope that you have a good weekend. Until next time, stay safe out there, stay sane out there. We'll see you soon. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.